Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, program number four, and uh, I'm still on two feet. <laughs> so uh, we'll just uh, see where the Lord takes us in this half hour. And again, we'd like to always thank our television audience for your prayer support, your financial. Uh, you'll never know what it all means. Now, again, my little wife is the one that's the promoter of these things. I'm going to put it on her shoulders, but she wants me to keep reminding you that this Q&A book is still available and uh, we send it out with any postage or handling for a flat $11, and uh, that's it. All right, we're going to keep right on going where we've been, and we're connecting the dots, and we've been coming all the way through, and we got to the Saul's conversion, his time out in the desert, how he came back, and uh, God's in control of everything. And now we're making the transition from God dealing with Israel and all the Israeli covenants and now we saw that Gentiles were getting interested up there at Antioch. And then from the Antioch church, four or five years later, Paul and Barnabas begin their first what we call missionary journeys. And as a real result of those missionary journeys, of course, Paul established Gentile churches throughout the area of Turkey and Greece predominantly, which was the major part of the Roman Empire. So I'm going to take you now up to the result of his ministry among the Gentiles and one of his letters, 1 Corinthians. Now, I'm going to start reading in chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 17. Now, of course, this isn't the earliest letter, but uh, it's earlier than some. <clears throat> verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it, the preaching of the cross, is the power of God." Have you heard anything like that in the Old Testament? Have you heard anything like that in the four Gospels? Not even in John. But see, the world can't see that. They just refuse to see it. My goodness, I get a call every once in a while. Unless you make too much of Paul, I'm following Jesus. Well, that's all well and good, but listen, Jesus doesn't give you the Gospel. It wasn't time for it. And so we have to constantly be reminded that all of this is in God's divine purposes, that yes, coming out of the Old Testament, everything was Jewish. He came to fulfill the promises. And through divine purposes, Israel rejected him, crucified him, brought about everything that needed to be done for this gospel. But now here we have a whole change in direction God did not let Paul have uh, the 12 influence him. He had to be totally taught something totally different, and he's going to be ref referring to it over and over as the revelation of the mysteries. And we're going to be looking at this for the next several programs, so get ready. The mysteries. And in the Greek, it's mysterion, which is also translated secret. So all these things that have been kept secret in the mind of God are now going to come from the pen of this apostle. Now that's why I'm always reminding people, don't go back to the book of Acts to get your doctrine because Luke wrote Acts and Luke is not the apostle of the Gentiles. It's that simple. Luke was simply the instrument that God used to record that transition. He wrote the gospel, but you see Luke is not the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul is. And so we have to constantly come back to Paul's apostleship. Now I'm going to run right ahead of any criticism and comment by showing you, now if you're going to condemn me for making too much of Paul, then I'm going to say, then you don't know your Bible. Go back with me to 2 Peter. And I'm reminded as you look, a lady from one of our western states, 
sent me a clipping out of her newspaper. And it was a letter to the editor, of course, and evidently some pastor had written a letter to the editor where he had emphasized some of these things from Paul's epistles. And this letter, <laughs> oh, wow, you talk about a mouthful of venom from start to finish. Just venom of the hatred for the apostle Paul. And what an idiot he really was. How he got kicked out of Greece. He got kicked out of Turkey. He got kicked out of Jerusalem. <laughs> and so the lady that sent me the article wrote across the top of the page. She said, now I see what you mean when you say that people hate Paul. Yeah, they do. They just can't stand the man because they don't like his doctrine, see? All right, but now look what Second Peter tells us concerning this apostle that everybody thinks shouldn't even be in our, not everybody, but a lot of people think shouldn't even be in our Bibles. I haven't even found it myself yet. Second Peter, chapter 3, and those of you who have been with me now over the years, you know where I'm going. Chapter 3, verse 15. <coughs> So I'm putting this up front so that you are tempted to call me or write me and say, hey, wait a minute, I, I can't follow this Paul bit. Well, then you can't believe what Peter says. Look what Peter wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit at the end of his life. A few weeks and he'll be martyred. But look what he's leaving with his Jewish listeners or readers. Account, understand that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him from the Lord, has written unto you. Now, isn't that plain? Peter is telling his Jewish listeners, now if you want salvation, the kingdom gospel has dropped away. It's disappeared. Now, if you want salvation as a Jew, you better go to Paul's epistles and get this gospel now for the age of grace. A Jew can't be saved today by just saying, I believe that Jesus was the Christ. That's not enough. He has to believe exactly as we do. All right, now look at verse 16. And this is where so many of our Christian leaders are. As also in all his epistles. Now, I think in verse 15, he's referring to the letter of Hebrews. I don't get adamant if people don't agree, but that's what it seems obvious to me that he had written the book of Hebrews. But now Peter says, not just the book of Hebrews, but all his epistles, Romans through Philemon, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood. See, there's Peter's legalism and which they that are unlearned and unstable twist, as they do also the other scriptures. Now, what does that tell you? Paul's epistles are scripture. Don't ever let anybody tell you Paul's epistles don't belong in our Bible. Peter says they're scripture, and that's good enough for me. They are the word of God, and they're directed to you and I as Gentiles primarily. And then, of course, all Scripture, Paul writes it himself, that all Scripture, Genesis through Revelation, is inspired of God, and is it profitable? Absolutely it is. But you will not find body of Christ truth outside of Paul. It's just not in there. It's all good background. It's good all foundation. But so far as understanding God's program for us today, it has to come from this man's epistles. All right, so now then, back to the verses that I just read, because uh, I want to go back to the board. Yeah, it's here. I want to go back. Now remember, everything of this Old Testament prophecies have stopped cold. The tribulation didn't come in. The second coming hasn't happened. But instead, we've been now 1,900 and some years in this dispensation of the grace of God which is all part of the Pauline writings. Next program, I'm going to put a circle down here. If Sharon's able to be with us, I'm going to have her put a circle, and we're just going to call it the body of church age truth, this body of Christ. And all of Paul's doctrine. In fact, I like to put it this way when people call on the phone. 
if by virtue of what may happen, if we were to lose our Bibles, if they were to be confiscated, if we could somehow, before they took our Bible, slip out Romans through Philemon, would we have enough to get by? Yes. We'd still have enough to get by. Because, you see, within the Pauline writings, we have the plan of salvation. We have the Christian walk. We have our hope for the end. Now, what more do you need? That's where all of the real meat for us today rests. Now, all the rest, as Paul said in Romans 15, all the rest is for our learning, to get a better understanding of how all of this has been going on since the creation of Adam. But to really get down to the nitty-gritty of being ready for eternity, we can find that if we just can keep Romans through Philemon, because it's all in there. But now, upon the other hand, if they took away Paul's epistles and we were left with what was left, we'd be in tough straits. There would be no real presentation of the gospel. There would be no real way to walk the Christian life. There would be no real hope to suddenly be translated because it's not back there, see? All right, so now then, if you'll come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 again, here is exactly how Paul puts it. He wasn't sent like a John the Baptist with the instructions to baptize. All his commission was preach the gospel, see? All right, let's move on. Verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it, the preaching of the cross, is the power of God. It's a supernatural thing. See, that's why good people cannot be saved by their works. Good works cannot bring in the supernatural power. That takes a response to the gospel. And then, yes, God moves in supernaturally. We become a new person. We get new, new desires, new ambitions, and everything is totally different. Okay, now then, let's just take a little time here on these early verses in Corinthians, because it's one of, like I said, one of Paul's earlier letters. It was written even before Romans. I think Galatians might have been written before, and we'll come back to that in our later programs. But now reading on here in 1 Corinthians. Verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent or the intellectual. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer or the argumentative individual in this world? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Now, whenever you read something like that, I hope you know your Bible well enough that you can, in your mind at least, just flip back to what could Paul refer to. Come back with me again to the book of Acts. Chapter 17. And this is exactly what he's referring to. And it's not that much different today. My, somebody would just share me at break time again. How the religious leaders of our beloved America are turning their back by the, by the hundreds against the truth of your word, God's word. And they're coming up with all these foreign ideas. It's coming in like a tsunami. It's just unbelievable, except we know that it's the end time. And we know that the apostasy, the falling away, is upon us. But all right, look what Paul encountered up at Athens. Chapter 17, let's just go down to verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him to Athens. And receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timothy for to come to him with all speed, they departed. And now while Paul waited for them at Athens, now remember they've been up to Philippi and they've been coming down the coast. They've stopped at Berea and Thessalonica and so forth. But now Paul has gone on ahead alone evidently and is waiting at Athens. His spirit was stirred in him. He just got shook up, we'd say today, 
when he saw the city of Athens holy or completely given to what? Idolatry. Idolatry. Can you imagine what that must have felt like that every place you went, there was pagan temples, there were pagan idols, and the pagan immorality was everywhere, things that are so evident, I don't even want to mention on this program, but we see it when we're on our uh, tours and stuff. It was everywhere. And it just, I suppose, broke his heart. See, it just stirred him. All right, now verse 17. Therefore, because of all this, he disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. And I imagine the chief conversation was this very thing. Well, how, is, how can you as synagogue religious Jews, how can you function in the midst of all this idolatry and all this immorality? See, I imagine he called them on the carpet. I, I think that's what he's doing. Now, verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics that were groups of intellectuals in this day. And when they encountered him, and some said, well, what will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setteth forth of strange gods. My goodness, they had thousands of them. <laughs> And yet they couldn't quite comprehend what Paul could be talking about with the one God of creation. All right, he seemeth to be set forth a strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the what? The resurrection. That threw them a curve. They had never heard of such a thing. To the Greek philosophy, to the pagans, you died like a dog and it was all over. Now, when they would talk about uh, an eternal life or something like that. They weren't talking about it in the terms that we do. They felt that when you left offspring, they would just continue your lifeline, and so it would on into time immemorial. But they had no concept of actually dying this body in death and then have a resurrection to come beyond them. They'd never heard of such a thing. All right, verse 19. And so they took him, that is Paul, brought him to Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. So they've got an interest. They could have pursued it, but they didn't. They didn't want to. They're no different than people today. They may take a, a, a temporary interest, but no, I'm not interested in any of this stuff, see? All right, now verse 21, for all the Athenians, the rank and file of the whole city, and the strangers, the people that were there as tourists or as business, they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. They knew there was something out there that they didn't know, and so they're willing to listen to anybody and everybody. But now the next verse, 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, up there on the Areopagus. And he said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive or I understand that in all things you're too superstitious. What's the core of religion? Superstition. Superstition to one form or another. Just stop and think about it. Why was it Lenin? who said that religion was the opiate of the masses? Yeah. Why? Because that's what religion does. It just puts them under the thumb of superstition, and these religious leaders can control them. So old Lenin knew if you had to get them out from under religion, then he could get them. One thing was as bad as the other, but see, that's what religion does. And this is exactly what Paul was confronting. All the superstition of their religion. Enough done? Yeah. Okay, let's go back to 1 Corinthians for the few moments we have left. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, through their intellectualism, they didn't know God. But on the other hand, God, in what seems foolish, 
it pleased God to save people who believe, even though it's so simple, instead of being complicated and intellectualized. Verse 22, for the Jews, Paul says, the religious Jews require a sign, and the Greeks, the intellectuals, like he had just confronted at Athens, and the intellectuals seek after wisdom. How many degrees do you have? Where did you go to school? Have you been to Alexandria? <laughs> See? All right. And then verse 24, no, 23. But we preach Christ crucified. Not a ton of intellectualism there. The simple fact that Christ died on that Roman cross, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews. He was a stumbling block. They couldn't believe who he was. They couldn't recognize that he was the creator of everything and then nailed to that Roman cross. If he was the creator, why didn't he call down legions of angels? See, that was their thinking. If he was who he said he was, all he would have had to do was cry out and God would have saved him, but they couldn't comprehend that this was something that had to be done in God's economy. All right, reading on. And unto the Greeks, with all of their education and all their intellectualism, it was a bunch of foolishness. But unto those who are called, that is, the believer who has responded to God's offer of saving grace, Unto those who are called, whether they be Jews and Greeks, it's Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now I just got to keep going. I was going to break there, but I got to keep going. Now verse 26. For you see your calling. Now stop a minute. Paul is not writing to a class of seminary students, is he? Who's he writing to? The rank-and-file Corinthians. Probably some longshoremen, probably some farmers, probably some merchantmen, common people. He's not, he's not addressing a seminary situation. So that's why it brings it all right down to our level, see? So he says, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, not from the upper crust, the elite as we call them today. No, not many of them have an inkling of what this is all about. They're not called. But who does God call? He chooses the foolish things. You know, I'm always referring to the plowboy in England. <laughs> I think I've got a trademark there. And I hear it over and over because it just hits home. The Word of God was intended to be understood by the average plowboy of England in 1500. They didn't even have high school education in those days. But was the Word of God understandable? Absolutely. And that's what this is telling us. The Word of God isn't just for the elite. It isn't just for the highly educated. It's for the least of us, see? All right, so he's chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. He has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, the things that the world in general looks down on, that's what he's chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to nothing, things that are. And why? so that nobody can ever brag in God's presence, I'm here because of who I am. Won't fly. It won't fly. And so we have to enter in as nothing but hell-bound, lost humanity, but God can save us and make us fit for his eternity. All right, now then, verse 30. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus, as a result of your saving faith, who of God is made unto us by virtue of our faith. It's imparted to us now to understand his wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and 
redemption, that we've been bought with the price, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. All right, now in the two minutes I have left, I think I'm going to take us back to Romans chapter 16. And this is what we're going to be hammering on now for at least the next four programs in our next taping, and maybe even eight of them. I don't know yet how long it'll take. But we're going to be hammering away at the fact that everything that was revealed to this apostle had been kept secret in the mind of God until revealed to him. And see, that's what Christendom will not accept. They want to feel that Paul is just sort of an addendum. He's just been added to that which really counts. And they can't get the concept that in this body of truth, what we call Paul's revelations of things kept secret, is where everything rests for us today. All right, you got Romans 16, and with this we'll be able to close. Verse 25. I've used it for the last 30 years, and I've asked seminars from west one end of this country to the other. Have you ever heard a Sunday morning sermon on this verse? Have you ever seen it taught in Sunday school? Never. Never. And here's why. They don't like what it says. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, and remember, crucified, buried, and risen again, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery this body of truth that's been kept secret and now revealed to this apostle, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since Jesus' ministry? No. Since Peter? No. Since when? Since the ages began. None of the Old Testament writers had any inkling that this was out there in the future. You know, I think the last time we were here in the taping, I showed how that Peter says, the Old Testament prophets searched diligently. They knew there was something out there, and they couldn't get it. And it didn't appear until God revealed it to this apostle and instructed him to take it out to the Gentile world. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.